All right, so why don't we start, because I know that Bethany has some time constraints, and I, we normally, Bethany, we wait until we get about 50 on, so we're, we're moving in the right direction, but hopefully uh, people got our, um, got our uh, invite reminders, because most people forget about it until we remind them. But uh, welcome to everybody for, uh, to our uh, webinar, uh, bi-weekly webinar that we have. Uh, we want we want to uh, remind everybody a couple things that the webinar is being recorded and uh, we have a guest speaker on today which we'll we'll uh, uh, announce uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, if you have a question, you can always use our chat feature, and then I'll ask Bethany the question. Or if you want to ask her directly, just please state your name and your affiliation. And also, we always ask to be respectful. Luckily, the people in Maryland have been very respectful because we've never had an issue. It's always been uh, everybody knows that we're all in it together. There's um, there's a lot of, um, um, I guess, there's a lot of conflicts with everybody right now because even though uh, we have all these different jurisdictions giving us advice about getting back to play, getting back on the field, it's really confusing because we have guidelines and orders from the state, from the local governments and counties, and then even from the state of Maryland Health Department, and then from local park and recreations. There's so much information going out that the clarity has been terrible. And we, like you, are trying to figure out legally what we can and can't do. I mean, it's really nuts. My son plays lacrosse, he's 15. He's scheduled to play in Leesburg, Virginia next week, next weekend, Saturday and Sunday at a big tournament. I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know. I really don't. But uh, Alan Lydier, our director of coaching, has done a lot of work with the staff and on his own to try to bring some clarity later on uh, on this webinar to help you guys uh, see where, where things are. Instead of being, you know, it almost seems like the wild, wild west out there because some people, some people are, uh, are abiding by some type of rules or regulations based on their jurisdiction. Other people are using the governor's ideas. Some people are doing, you know, the different counties. One county said the other uh, uh, a couple days ago that fields would would not open up until uh, a couple months, and then they reversed it. So they must have had a lot of pressure. So, um, but um, so we're going to talk about that in, 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 the, in the coming uh, hour about uh, some better clarity of where, we, where we're going with as far as getting back uh, on the fields. I know that I got an email from the Soccerplex yesterday that their fields are open for rentals now, rental. So I don't know if that's, if you can, I know it's for training. I'm not sure if it's, uh, you know, what more we can do on those fields, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So uh, I know Bethany has time constraints, so I want to bring on our secretary of, the, of our board, Tom, uh, and Tom's going to introduce Bethany and then we could chat about how this affects the kids out uh, in the, in the uh, 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 field. So Tom? Yeah, hey, um, I'm, it's a real thrill for me to introduce Bethany Rubin Henderson. Uh, Bethany is the CEO of DC Scores, the organization I work for, and that's with uh, 3,000 kids in 72 schools in DC. And she's also CEO of America Scores, which is the national uh, organization. That's with uh, 12,000 uh, players nationwide. Almost exclusively, well, all exclusively, our players are low income children of both color all across the country. Uh, we operate an after-school program with a soccer component, a poetry component, and a service learning component. And we go all year long. And uh, just to give you some background about Bethany, Bethany comes to us from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She got her BA and MA at the University of Pennsylvania and her law degree at Harvard. Uh, prior to coming to DC Scores in 2014, she was working in the Obama White House. Um, and today she's going to talk about, you know, what we focus on is scores. And actually we all focus on in team sports. It's a social emotional development of our children. 
So I like. Um, I thought it would be interesting for us to hear from Bethany what the kids are going through in this crisis. So I'll just hand it off to Bethany. You there? Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark, uh, and everyone at MSYSA for having me. It's really a privilege to be here with you all today. I do want to take a moment and recognize that today is Juneteenth, uh, which is a really important day in the history of our country, um, not just for the children that we work with, but certainly very relevant in our community. Uh, so I do want to take a moment and recognize the day. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of y'all about the impact of the pandemic on kids who typically turn to their youth soccer team as their support network. As Tom mentioned, at SCORES, both locally in D.C. and nationally, and actually North America-wide, we have programming in the U.S. and Canada, we work with children who are very low income, who have very limited access to sports opportunity, and all of our programming is 100% free. And so the way our programming works, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is we build inner city soccer leagues and we embed them at schools. We focus on elementary schoolers and middle schoolers who are really serving that K-8 population. And every soccer team is school-based. The coaches come from within the schools as well. And every soccer team, in addition to practicing and playing in our leagues together, also writes and performs original poetry with their soccer teammates and designs and carries out service projects with their soccer teammates. So it's a really mind, body, and soul approach that we take, but all centered around that team and that soccer team. The experiences that we had, you know, before the pandemic, before Black Lives Matter re-exploded uh, into the public consciousness, is working with kids who live in daily trauma. The vast majority of the children that we live with get the vast majority, that we work with, excuse me, get the vast majority of their meals at school. Um, our programming, in addition to being their soccer league, is their safe space. It's their home base. It's the place where they can actually be themselves. It is where they get their afternoon snacks for many of them. And in order for us to run leagues, we actually have to transport the kids around town for games, for tournaments, that type of thing, because the families that we work with, by and large, are limited in capacity for a variety of reasons. So we've been pretty focused uh, throughout our 25 year history on that social emotional aspect of kids development and how do we le leverage the relationships built through that soccer team experience. And I really emphasize the word team, that coach mentor experience to help the kids really develop as people, not just as players. And for us, it's really people first, players second. So when the pandemic hit and obviously sent all of us into a spiral where we weren't able to gather in person, we weren't able to bring our teams together in person, it posed, as you all know, many, many, many unique challenges. An additional one for the vast majority of the children that we work with is that they're on the wrong side of the digital divide for right now, meaning they don't have consistent access to devices or internet in their homes for distance learning, let alone for enrichment, let alone for connecting no. with their safe environments. And so we've done a couple of things. I know many of you have been innovative at how you've reached out to kids. We've done a number of things as well with the goal being really trying to reach kids where they are at and really thinking about how do we help every child, our North Stars, but how do we help every child feel safe, supported, connected, and hopeful so that by the time it is safe for us to return to play in person, they are emotionally ready to return to play and they feel connected to their team and coaches, not disconnected to their team and coaches. We know, as you know, when you come back in person, being with your team, that safe space, that release is going to be more important than ever, but there's also going to be a huge amount of trauma that coaches are going to have to be helping their teams navigate through and, and recover from. There's gonna be a huge amount of trauma that's gonna come out uh, in ways you may not expect from your players once they're back in a safe place. And we know that with our players tenfold because for many of our players, their homes are not their safe places. Their neighborhoods, their streets are not their safe places. So we've done a couple of things that I wanted to share with y'all that I thought might be helpful as you're thinking ahead about your return to play and how you navigate not just the logistics, but the support of the players and their families. One is, uh, like I know many of your organizations, we have, um, we held throughout the spring and we're holding throughout the summer virtual programming, right? So we held virtual online soccer programs, some live, some asynchronous for kids with different access uh, levels and capacities. And we're doing that through the summer as well. In addition, we reached, we put things up online, we put workouts and <clears throat> soccer drills and soccer lessons, as well as poetry and writing drills and writing lessons and activity uh, community action drills and action lessons 
uh, up on a, our website. Uh, we created a printed packet as well, all targeted at our population, all overlaid with the SCORE's values, the SCORE's branding, so it feels very much like SCORE's. It feels like they can connect with their safe space, but we're having this combination of synchronous, right, live activities uh, and asynchronous, whether that be a recorded post that goes up on Instagram every day at 3.30, whether that be a printed packet um, that gets sent to their home, whether that be stuff they can pull up on their mom's phone uh, and do a scores um, drill or activity that way. Really thinking about how do we meet kids where they are. The second thing, uh, and I should say for our summer camps, which we're launching, um, Tom and the rest of our program team were out at Audi Field outside packing summer camp kits. We have about 600 kids signed up for our virtual summer camps right now. We're mailing every child a camp kit, it includes a soccer ball, includes a pump, includes cones, everything that they need to participate. So trying to remove all barriers to participation as much as possible uh, in a world where we're all forcibly distanced from each other. So that's one, meeting kids where they are, making sure they have the immediate resources they need to keep playing soccer and stay connected to their team and feel connected. Number two is working closely with coaches. Uh, the coaches are the frontline workers for all of us, right? And whether your coaches are volunteer, whether they're paid, in our case, most of our coaches are paid, um, they are the people who are interacting day in and day out with the kids and their families in normal times. They are the frontline relationships. And we thought it was very important to help maintain those relationships as much as possible between the coaches and the players um, during this time to create some sense of constancy, normalcy, hope, and connection. And so we have been holding weekly conversations with our coaches uh, where we share what's going on with DC scores, what our plans are for the next week, month, season, to the extent that we know them, and also getting feedback from the coaches. What are you seeing on the ground? What are you hearing from families and kids? What do you need from us to continue to support your team? Uh, we encouraged our coaches to hold live team sessions whenever possible. We encouraged our coaches to connect with our kids whenever possible and actually set up a structure for coach calls. There were some teams where the kids' uh, device access was so limited that having a live practice wasn't feasible. And so in those case, cases, we worked with the coach to create a calling guide for them to call through. And we had coaches who literally called through every one of their teammates every couple of weeks. And that's how they reached out and connected with the kids, kept them connected, pointed them to the resources that were asynchronous uh, and encouraged them and their families to continue engaging in some form or fashion. We had coaches who held live Instagram sessions every day at a certain time. That was how that team chose to communicate. The kids would show up and interact with the coach that way. And those were many, you know, three minute, four minute, 10 minute sessions uh, with little workouts that the kids could rely on and count on. We had coaches who held live uh, synchronous sessions via Zoom, and Microsoft Teams, other platforms the schools were using um, to work through some of the distance learning curricula that we created with their teams, both in the writing and poetry side, and to create those team moments and connections where the kids could really get back together and for a few moments set aside and forget the insanity uh, and the stress of the world that is happening around them. So really focusing on the coaches, empowering the coaches, listening to the coaches, supporting the coaches and reaching out and connecting with kids has been another approach that we have taken. And we're continuing to do that through the summer and as we look ahead to the fall. Now let me talk for a moment about um, what we're looking at at the fall. We are anticipating, because we are a school-based league, meaning almost all of our programming takes place in schools and in a handful of rec centers, we are um, partnering with schools and dependent on school rules for whether or not or when we can reopen uh, in-person leagues is the way that I would put it. What we are anticipating right now, based on what we know, is that at least within Washington, D.C., the schools are anticipating some form of to-be-determined hybrid schooling for the fall and a significant number of students to opt out of going to any sort of in-person school, uh, at least in the immediate term. And so how do you plan a league around that, right? It's nearly impossible because there's not a one size fits all in this context. So for us, the way we are approaching this is looking again at what is our North Star. Our North Star in this environment is to help kids stay and feel um, safe, supported, connected, and hopeful until we can all get back to some semblance of normalcy or can all come together around a new normalcy. And so in that vein, we are looking at rethinking the ways that we think about what a soccer league is for the short term. Rethinking ways we think about what attendance and showing up for the team means, right? In good times, not every child in our programming can show up every day, whether or not they want to because of family limitations and other challenges in their lives. In these times, expecting every child, the ones that we work with, to be able to show up at two o'clock every Tuesday online is a bridge too far 
given the reality of the constraints in many of their lives, digital access, parental involvement or lack thereof, childcare responsibilities for siblings, hunger and other things. So how do we make sure that we're not putting in place expectations that are unmeetable and that turn kids off? Because our goal is to keep as many kids connected as possible during this time so that we don't lose them along the way, so that we're able to help them stay on track, we're able to help them work through and navigate and process the trauma um, as best as possible. So that's a little kind of insight into who DC Scores is and how we work and what we are thinking of uh, and how we're approaching maintaining our leagues, maintaining those connections and those soccer teams and the all importance of those soccer teams for so many kids and not just the kids in DC scores, right? For many kids, that soccer team is their safe place. It is their release. How we can maintain as much of that feel as possible, even though we're not able to do the in-person bringing people together the way that we would like. Can you, uh, excuse me, can you repeat that please? Yeah, so. Mark's, Mark's favorite one-liner. I'm just mm -hmm. joking. <laughs> so it's very interesting, the information and the work that you do in DC because the board, the Maryland board is very passionate about the, our future and doing a lot of the same things that you're doing. We wanted, I think we talked about it about a year and a half ago when we, when we first met. One of our goals in the state is to is to create uh, the same type of programming in Maryland to help to help these kids be able to to join clubs that they would normally not be able to join. And we're trying to formulate. Uh, we're in the beginning stages, but we're trying to formulate a plan that we can put together for the state of Maryland to help get some of these kids into clubs. And some of the ways we were thinking of doing it to help offset the costs were one, we were thinking about doing sponsorships. Two, we were thinking about having MSYSA create sponsorships from our operating fund. And three, having the clubs buy into it. So when you take, a, when you take the layer of, of discounts, so if a, if, a, if, the, if a child has to pay five, hypothetical, has to pay $500 to join a club, and MSYSA gives $200 per player, hypothetical, now that's $300 left in the pie. And if we can get the club to maybe reduce their fee to buy into this program, that's $100. And now we're down to $200. And maybe with that $200 can be financed by sponsorships so that we can provide, so similar to what you have, but it, kind of like a different angle. And that way we can get some of these kids to be able to join clubs that would never have the opportunity before. And if we could pull that off in the state of Maryland, that would be like a, a legacy that we would you know, leave for, for many years to come. I think we're gonna do it and I'm gonna lean on you for advice because you've already done it. So I think, you know, Mark, I'm really glad to hear y'all are thinking about that, right? Because at DC, the poverty is highly concentrated. That, that is not the case as you go further out in the DMV. It's much more diffuse. Um, and scholarships are a really great start. And simply bringing a kid who does not otherwise have access onto a team, removing that one barrier, I think it's important to remember only removes that one barrier, that there are other barriers that those kids face, that those kids live with. They're going to be different from a lot of their peers. And I know this because a lot of our, um, our alumni have gone on to play uh, in, in travel leagues um, and other organizations. And there are cultural differences. There are access in terms of being able to get to and from practice challenges uh, that they have that other kids may not have. And so I would encourage y'all to think about, I think this is an awesome first start is to remove that cost barrier. That's huge. How are you going to make sure when the kid comes on uh, and joins that team that they're really able to feel an integrated part of the team and not sort of that outside scholarship kid. And that's just, it's a challenge. I don't have great answers for that, uh, but I know that this is an issue that our kids report back even with the best of intention teams. Yeah, it's, I think it's such an important aspect in our sport to be able to reach that population that doesn't have an opportunity to play soccer. And if we can provide that for the kids, and I mean, you're already doing it for the kids in D.C., we would love to do it for the kids in Maryland. It would be, it would, 
it would just be a, 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 a an incredible feat to be able to, to pull it off and and to help kids. And I'll tell you why I the reason why I'm passionate about it is a couple of years and the board no, already knows because I already told many of the board members. But years ago, one of my supervisors that works for my company was telling me that his kid plays soccer, and I was all excited. And I was telling him that that's so great. And I said, Well, what club does he play for? And he said, oh, sir, he doesn't play for a club. We can't afford the club fees. And my first indication was to just pay the club fees for him because he was a great employee. He's just, he is a great employee. And, you know, I felt horrible when he said that. And then I, and then I realized that if I pay the club fees for him, I'd have to probably, the word would go through my company like wildfire and I'd have to pay the fees for everyone. So I kind of backed off, but it, it stuck with me. It was like, I, you know, it's like a lot of us take it for granted when our kids are playing in a sport and, it, you know, we pay the fees, we go, we take, we get them to the fields, we talk to the coach, we go to the tournaments, we buy the water bottles, we do all the things as parents, but a lot of these kids don't have that opportunity. I would love for Maryland to do it. It would be such a great thing for us to do that. And I'm, I'm passionate about it. And I know a lot of the board members are, and I'm sure a lot of the club leaders that are on right now would would uh, buy into it because it's such a great thing. And is, does anybody have any questions for Bethany by any chance? Well, I guess you answer you your questions. Uh, were, yeah, uh, I've got I've got a quick one. I, I think. Um... Hi, Bethany. It's Alan Lydia. I'm the uh, director of coaching for MSYSA. Um, just, uh, I just kind of wanted to ask, I mean, obviously with the virtual learning, um, you know, how, how has that sort of progressed? I know sort of a lot of the clubs uh, in the beginning, there was, you know, kind of a lot of, you know, pretty, a pretty good response. But obviously we found after a few weeks with, especially with school and everything else, there was sort of this fatigue. Uh, have you come up with any other sort of ways in which to, engage the participants and try and, um, you know, possibly reach them in, in other ways. Um, you know, for instance, we tried to put out a sort of safeguarding um, uh, officer. So, you know, we put out to the players if they have any, you know, uh, you know, challenges or, you know, we basically provided a number that they can call and, you know, if they need to discuss things, whether, you know, whether that's soccer based or not, is there anything else that you've kind of provided, um, you know, for possibly those that, you know, numbers where have dwindled? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've got resources online. I should say everything we've done is in English and Spanish because we have a significant Spanish speaking population, a significant percentage of our children whose parents speak primarily Spanish. Wow. Uh, and especially because we work with little kids. So all of our programming, all of our resources have been in English and Spanish. And you can, you can see it at parents.dcscores.org, um, kind of the resources that we put out there. To your point specifically, this is where we have really relied on our coaches. We've continued to pay our coaches through wow. the pandemic um, for work done and connecting with their teams. But what's been different is we're not paying our coaches to run soccer sessions. We're paying our coaches to connect with kids. Right, and so a lot of those conversations have come through the coach. Um, we, had, we asked before we even launched the live sessions, we asked every coach um, or at least one coach from every team to call through the team, to call every kid in the team and have a conversation with them. Um, and it's really come out of those conversations and it's come back to us, this particular team has multiple kids struggling with hunger. Uh, they're not getting food. This particular team has some other issue and we've been able to connect those teams kind of on an ad hoc basis with um, with donors, supporters, people who can help solve those problems, right? So we're able to get a whole bunch of um, grocery cards, for example, for one team in a particular neighborhood where there was, you know, two grocery stores. Uh, we were able to get gift cards to those grocery stores specifically for those kids' families uh, and helping connect kids that way. But it comes down to that relationship for, between the coach and the kid, the team uh, with each other and the team and the coach to be able to really get that information. Because as y'all all know, in this sort of weirdly distanced world we're living in, getting real information is hard. Right. And, uh, and is there any sort of specific safeguarding policy? Into, and I know a lot of clubs are sort of hesitant to have their coaches reaching out direct to, to children, you know, whether that's, uh, is there any sort of policies that you put in centered around, 
you know, um, you know, for instance, it may be okay. Well, if you're going to reach out to a player, ensure that the, you know, that you're contacting the parent if possible, and trying to keep that connection or having another adult, for instance, on the call. Is there anything that you kind of give the guidelines for the coaches? In yeah, that it's a great question. It's certainly something we have talked about a lot. Our coaches, because they're all paid coaches, are already. Uh, under contract with us with a substantial safeguarding provisions in place. We went back and looked at those uh, and determined that the fact that the conversations were happening digitally um, did not change things. Our coaches already were in contact uh, with the kids and their families. And for those first set of calls, uh, the structure was, please talk to the parent first. That right. must be who you communicate first and ask permission to talk to the child. For as many sessions uh, of the live synchronous sessions as possible, we've also had staff join. And so our coaches know that our staff can and will pop in and out of any of these sessions, which creates an additional safeguard um, factor. And for a lot of them, what we found, particularly with the littler kids, the kindergarten, first, second graders, the parents have been participating as well. Right. They've been getting on, they've been wanting to experience. So there's been a little bit of a different interactions depending on the different age levels of the kids, um, certainly different with middle schoolers and the types of interactions and the type of parental engagement uh, than it has been with the younger children. But it is something we're continuing to navigate. Yeah, cool. And the last one, I think this is really just general towards everybody. Um, I know, uh, for instance, Ellicott City have done a, a program called Get on the Bus, which is fantastic. Um, you know, the, there are, I guess, initiatives and funding available from USSF and, and you know, to be able to um, encourage clubs to engage in more, um, you know, finding more diverse, you know, programs. Um uh, I'm not sure how that's going to look after the pandemic in terms of what is available, but I know there are incentives out there for clubs to to try and engage more of the uh, more of your communities. And obviously, there is funding and grants and things like that available that cl clubs can apply for as well. So, um, I appreciate time. Any other questions from anybody? I just have an observation, and I have to talk. This is Dan at <laughs> OBGC and Bethany DC United. I just got to give you guys a shout out. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with the things that they do aside from the football, you need to go really take advantage of what these kids can do. Um, and she can attest to this. When they come to our office and they do the poetry readings and some of the other things, it's really powerful. And the things that they do away from the pitch, they give these kids some sense of structure, belief, um, unity, it's a great organization. Um, wherever you work, you should talk to that company about getting involved with them. Um, they are top class, and they've got some really, really good people there. It's why we've done everything with our staff and everything to put everything uh, with them. And I can't say enough great things about them. I'm not even scratching the surface. Well, I feel the same way. I think they're great. And I'm going to put I'm going to put uh, Bethany on the spot in front of everybody and let her know that I'm going to utilize her knowledge to help Marilyn kind of formulate um, some some programming that we maybe we can do it together, Bethany. Maybe you can help us. I you know there's I'm actually um, getting some private emails from club leaders across the state of Maryland telling me how excited they are to try to do this. So. As excited as I am and the board of directors are, so are the affiliates, which, you know, it's like anything else. If we all buy in and can do this, if we can get, if we can get kids all over the state joining different clubs, it, it, you know, and helping them do it by fine, you know, by financing it. And, you know, um, it would, it would just be like an incredible thing. You know, it's an also, it's also an incredible thing just to, just to run the state of Maryland and have all these kids and all these teams play, but to be able to hit that segment of the community that never had the opportunity to play soccer on a, on a, you know, on a field with a team structured with coaching. And it's just, uh, it's, I think it's just exciting. So um, um, uh, we have a question it says, how can we get in touch with Bethany and her organization? And, yes, Bethany and, already, and, and Bethany already responded, so that's great. So uh, we really appreciate you coming on. It was exciting to hear this angle. Every, every uh, webinar that we have, Bethany, we're always looking at different angles on different things. We've had 
you know, lieutenant governor on, we've had coaches on, we've had uh, uh, insurance people on, we've had um, new, uh, state senators on, and uh, it's a pleasure to get your information because it's really exciting to hear what you guys are doing. So thanks again for spending the time with us this morning. Thank Can you I say for something, please? Is this Pachuca? Yeah, I'm very, very happy to hear what everything that you guys say, and also for the president, Amos, what you say. I'm actually very excited because it's very Pachuca. We have the same problems right now. Um, we're trying to come back to practice, and more than three quarters of the club, the teams that we have, are not being able to come to practice. The reason a lot of parents lost their jobs. So it's a crisis that we have, not only in D.C., but right now in the site where I am in Montgomery County. So I'm very happy to hear that, you know, uh, all of you guys are willing to help and advise us how to bring these kids back and um, continue with, you know, soccer actually getting out of trouble because of the sports and the school. Thank you. Thanks, Julio. If there's Thanks. any other any other comments or anything? Okay, so... Thank you for having me, Mark. I appreciate what y'all are doing. As y'all know, you know, soccer can be a lifeline for many, many kids. It's certainly a lifeline for the kids in D.C. scores and America scores. And that lifeline is more important now than ever, given what's going on in the world. So I really appreciate y'all being thoughtful about how you're continuing to engage kids. Well, and thanks. Appreciate you thanks, having me on. thanks so much. Thanks, Bethany. Thanks, Bethany. <clears throat> Okay, so before we, we jump on to, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, State Cup with Brad Roos, I wanted to ask everybody, and you can, you can email me privately through the chat, but I'm wondering if we need to change the time of our webinars. And the reason is, is that when we first started having these, most of us were not at work. So a lot of people were able to jump on the call and there wasn't, a, it, there wasn't an issue, but I think since, since the beginning of our webinars a few months ago, a lot of people have matriculated back to, to their employment. And I think, I think that we're not reaching the majority or vast uh, affiliates because people are back to work. So if you think that it's a good, it might be, if you think it's a good idea to maybe change it to either an early evening, we can also try that. Uh, you know, a late afternoon or an early evening, I, I'm, I'm for it. But I like, I like to get some, you know, feedback either, you know, you can either chat with everyone or send it, send it to me privately and then we'll, we might be able to change something. So with that being said, the next uh, person I'd like to introduce is Brad Roos. He's our State Cup uh, representative and director and he's going to give us a quick update. Brad? Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, hope everybody's doing well. I think, as everybody knows, we had to cancel both State Cup and President's Cup, uh, which was unfortunate, but uh, we are trying to move forward. Please note that if you are, uh, if it's a U19 team, you'll be automatically be getting back a refund. Um, all other teams will be getting a credit, a full credit, 100% credit for next year. Um, and that includes, I, I've gotten several calls from clubs asking if they could transfer that from one team to the other. Um, and so, yes, you can, uh, whether even if a team switches from President's Cup to State Cup or vice versa, we will, uh, we will use the uh, registration fee that you paid this year. For any group, as extenuating circumstances or U18 teams that have 50% or more seniors on their team, uh, there is a, a form in the uh, uh, GOT Sport area where you signed up for State Cup that you can request a refund. And those are being evaluated uh, probably at the beginning of next week. And then we'll make those refunds back based upon what the circumstance is. I did speak at the last webinar that we are going to try to hold a festival. I can now say to you, give you a little bit more details of that. It will, it will occur on the weekend of July 25th and 26th, the last weekend in July. Uh, and it will be held at the SAC Fields in Columbia. Uh, Craig Blackburn has graciously agreed to host uh, those at festival at the end of, end of July. 
There will be an additional fee. It will only cover uh, the amount for the fields and the referees. Uh, MSYSA will not be making anything off of, the, of this particular event. The idea is just to get teams back on the field playing as a way to kind of get back to normalcy. We will have COVID protocols in place. I'm working with Craig and the State Cup President's Cup Committee to formula, formalize what those protocols will be. Um, basically, an age group will play either Saturday or Sunday. They'll play in a three to four hour time slot. You play three 30 minute matches. Uh, there are no records, there's no awards. It's just a chance to get out and play for the teams. Um, and I will, we will have something up on the MSYSA website. It sent out an email to all of MSYSA teams uh, by Wednesday, July 1st. So I'm excited about this. It's, we're, we're, we really feel it's important. It's something the board has discussed a lot about. We just want to get people out on the fields playing again. Um, and so we, we hope everybody is supportive of this and excited about it. Um, any, any questions for me, real quick? Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, Jessica Hafer was scheduled to give a quick report on registration. She's actually onboarding a club right now, so she's going to pop on um, sometime during the uh, remaining uh, webinar to just give a quick report. So. Uh, Finally, we have Alan Lydia, our director of coaching, has a lot of information about the confusion that we've uh, that I chatted about early on in this on this webinar about the uncertainty about who can go on the field, who can't go on the field, what what uh, uh, county is is able to go on the field, what county isn't. Remember that on our website, the MSYSA website, there's an actual tool there that you could click on and go right to your county and get the latest updated information about what you can and can't do on your specific county. So try to use that tool if you, if you can. I know uh, Brendan uh, from our office worked really hard putting it together and it's automatically updated daily so you can see uh, what, what's happening throughout your county. So, uh, Alan, you want to come on and give us your latest and greatest about uh, the confusion and uncertainty and a little bit of clarity of where we are with this with the uh, fields opening? Alan? Hey, sorry, Mark. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's I'm, uh, <laughs> as usual, losing internet in and out. So, um, just quickly before we jump in, uh, there's, there should be a poll out there for the for you to complete, uh, just to give us a little bit of feedback on um, the preferred time for the webinar. We've got about 62% complete, so um, if you can just go in and, and, and put your um, most popular time, um, I'm probably going to end the poll in about uh, two minutes from now, and then... Uh, uh, obviously, we can make a decision based off everybody's feedback. So I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, so thanks, Mark. I mean, obviously, uh, I fielded a lot of different questions this week and, and maybe over the last two weeks. Um, you know, I think that the, the biggest confusion being, um, you know, where are we in the phases? Which phase should we be in? Um, you know, with games returning, does that mean we're in phase three if we can have competition? Um, so there's, you know, there's lots of different, um, I guess, uh, information coming out and uh, it's kind of very difficult to kind of navigate. Uh, I think really for, for us as a state, again, it's, it's a reminder that obviously, um, you know, the reason for that is because every jurisdiction is different. Uh, whether that's your parks and recs have certain stipulation, whether it's your county government that are mandating certain things. Um, you know, so it's always a step-by-step -step process. And even our guidelines, obviously, uh, at the end of the day, you as, a, as an organization, as club leaders, have to make the decision on, you know, from all of the information that's available, what's the best thing in, in your area. So really, you're taking it from the state, you're taking it then from the local county jurisdictions, uh, and then obviously trying to use our guidelines 
uh, to put into place your your best practices for your club. So um, I think that the we looked at a couple of different things that that were you know confusing a few people. Um, uh, we know that the the state is an so uh, the state obviously released that events were now allowed. So we're starting to see, you know, games pop up, um, playing, you know, uh, competitive games, tournaments are sort of reopening, and um, you know, sort of uh, trying to encourage people to participate again in in sort of um, you know game situations. So uh, I think that again back to the phased approach to return to play depending where you are you're still going through those phases and some people i was on the a call last week with uh, the chief medical officer at ussf um one of the questions was well i'm not going to start until september with my team should i start on the phase at that time or do i do i start with a phased approach and the advice was you know go through the phases don't just go and start out where you are because, again, you're, the purpose of the phases is to assess the risk, to assess, you know, and, and manage your group so that if things escalate, you have the ability to be able to understand where it's come from and how to manage it. And I think that's, that's the critical part in terms of understanding that really the phases are there to guide you to be able to assess the risk and follow the CDC guidelines. Um, so a couple of things that we changed, um, you know, physical contact is, is allowed. Uh, there was lots of questions around the group sizes. Uh, there's no magic number. There are various numbers out there still in terms of 10 per group that might be coming from the parks and rec, uh, others there's the, you know, there's no stipulations. Um, I think it boils down to common sense. Obviously, we'll, we'll, some of you are working towards camps and that's been a question. Okay, well, as a camp, how many kids can I put on a field, uh, you know, based on the size of the groups? Um, and again, I think that's, that's really, uh, what can you manage? What can you continue to be able to safely evaluate uh, and, and, and still be able to keep um, as much physical distancing in place as possible, especially when they are not in activities or small-sided activities. Um, so you have to really uh, look at the, again, the space that you have available and make your decisions based off of your, your, your environment. Um, but for us, obviously, physical contact is now allowed um, during each training session, but we try to encourage you to limit uh, the duration. So. Um, when we're looking at that session, um, whenever possible, um, you know, try to continue with the individual uh, isolated approach. For and again, we don't want to put a time frame in. We don't want to say you have to do eighty percent of your session unopposed. That's the, again down to to the to the risk assessment for you, for you. Um, so limit some of your uh, small sided activities. Um, a couple of the other questions that have come forth have really been centered around can we scrimmage we yes within your groups um however we still depending on what phase you are in um try to you know try to limit that opportunity and gradual return to that so if you're going to do scrimmages inside of your own club yes it is allowed in phase two however Again, don't do it straight away. Do it when you feel safe and you've obviously been through the four weeks of phase one. You feel comfortable. You've been able to manage maybe a week or so in phase two. Now you can start to look um, at, at possibly doing in, in-house scrimmages, you know, with your own clubs across groups. And that's, that's, that's another part of the challenge that we face. We want to try and encourage you to stay um, within your own groups as much as possible. However, we know that if people are going out doing tournaments and, um, you know, other activities, it's very difficult to say, no, you, sh you know, um, you can't have an in-house scrimmage. You know, that's, that's, it, it doesn't make sense. So um, I think the governor said it two weeks ago, just because we can doesn't mean that we should. And I think that has to always stay in your mind. Um, the biggest challenge is obviously for those teams that are entering into tournaments 
and that have tournament play upcoming from a safety standpoint in terms of physical preparation. Uh, obviously, if you're, if you're just entering into phase one and in three weeks' time, four weeks' time, you have a tournament, your team's not going to be ready, right? So in that situation, for that team, you may have to skip the phases, right? And when I say skip the phases, maybe you have to move into phase two sooner because you need to start uh, engaging in game time. And, and so we're preparing the players physically ready for competition. Um, although we don't encourage you participating in competition if, if you don't have to, um, you know, but ultimately some teams are already registered and obviously things are starting to un, uh, sort of evolve with league play. Um, you know, we encourage that in phase three. We're not at phase three yet. Um, however, um, you know, this is where the confusions come in because obviously tournaments, league play is opening up. Um, you know, I just saw an email from EDP with the under 23 leagues going to be opening um you know so again it it kind of puts a challenge on you as an organization as to stipulate in what phase those teams or or your organization is in and and it may have to go to a team by team basis so you may say okay those teams that are not competing continue to cr progress through the phases four weeks but those teams that maybe are set up to go into tournaments we encourage you to try to get to that phase two as quick as possible get some games in and then we can start to uh provide you know longer duration for practices uh to ensure that the fitness aspect and the uh the physical aspect is um in terms of their periodization is increased maybe increasing the number of practices for those teams as opposed to those that are not competing um you know again these are all uh questions that are fielded uh, i had one question which was you know can I do more than one practice in a week yes if that team's going into training yeah multiple sessions get them ready um can they scrimmage yes try and keep it in house if possible or, or at least local or, you know centralize localize your 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 trainings if possible uh your games if possible so um you know, so those are pretty much the questions that are fielded this week. And, and like I say, there's lots of different answers. Um, and, and I think you almost as an organization have to go by a team by team basis because you've got different coaches, I presume, asking you questions throughout the club. Um, you know, obviously, if it's a more centralized club and you control what, what programs those you know, teams do, then you, you're, you're obviously under more control. Um, However, those team-based sort of organizations where the teams are asking if they can do this, um, the answer is essentially, you know, like I say, even though you can, doesn't mean that you should. Um, you know, and ultimately, it's, it's really your decision as an organization based off of all the guidelines that are available to make that decision for that team or, or for your club in general. Um, any, any questions on that so far? Because I'm going to move into, I, I just want to skip through a little bit of cleanliness because um, I know from myself and my, my own experiences doing team trainings right now, I just want to cover a few points. Um, any questions centered around the phase uh, or any terminology that we've changed, um, you know, based on groups or scrimmages or anything that kind? Don't forget to use the chat feature. I'm going to end the poll. Oh, apologies. Lost the uh, internet there. So I'm going to end the poll. Did you get it? All right, morning. Looks like mornings have it still. Look like morning still had it, Alan. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's a, it looks consistent across the ball. I think for you know the likes of the coaches that some people are going to be out on the field, and then those that are working in the you know in the in the in the daytime, they may not have sessions on a Friday night, or they can rearrange the sessions 
not to have it on a Friday evening. So, um, again, you know, obviously these sessions are recorded. So I think it doesn't really matter when we, well, it does matter. I mean, obviously we want, we want more participation if possible. However, if it's consistent, you know, between evenings and mornings, um, you know, I, th I think we're just, it's, it's catch 22, right? It's, All right, it's so, so it looks like we're going to continue the mornings until, uh, until we get enough people that want to change it. So for this point, we'll, from this point on, we'll continue Friday, every other Friday, remember. So next week we will not have a webinar, but the following week, I think it's the 3rd of July, um, if, if, if that's the correct date, we'll have it 1130 day before yeah. July 4th. All right. So thanks, Alan. So can I, can I just skip? I've got a couple of things I just want to cover in terms of cleanliness. Um, again, this was a couple of questions that I fielded this, this, this week. Um, uh, you know, so a, a, a few have kind of asked me centered around, you know, keeping, keeping the field clean and some of the things or the potential, uh, for some issues centered around, you know, now that, you know, some parents may be coming out and sitting watching um, some of the practices or certainly centered around if you're hosting a game, for instance, what are some of the things that you have to keep in mind? Um, so I'll just put a quick list of some of the supplies, obviously, that as, as an organization you should be thinking about. Um, there was some questions in the beginning as to whether you can utilize thermometers uh, at the field. Uh, I think that was clarified and that is okay to utilize that. However, we don't want to be sharing that information with anybody else. Um, I'm still utilizing with, with, with my group, just encourage them to do it at home. Um, I'm not doing it at the field, but obviously if you did purchase thermometers and you're utilizing that, it's obviously non non-contact forehead thermometers um you know can be used if that's that's something that you especially if you're going into camps some people may be utilizing that as a safeguard policy um as you go through a camp process uh disposable gloves obviously um face masks cloth face masks hand sanitizer sprays and wipes those are the main uh, tools that you need to, you know, ensure that you have read, readily available um, at your location for whether that's practices, camps, clinics, whatever uh, it is that you're providing at this time. Um, again, just continuing to encourage that hand washing. Uh, there's not always an opportunity at the field. Obviously, there's not uh, hand washing, um, uh, you know, facilities unless you're indoors, you're doing a classroom session for some reason. Um, you know, with with camps, uh, just encouraging that regular washing of the hands. Uh, hand sanitizer got to be at least sixty percent in terms of alcohol. Um, so just encouraging good habits before, after practices. Again, breaks if it's a summer camp or anything like that. Making sure before the break, after the break, um, you've got to be careful. Obviously, that they're not collaborating at a particular wash station you know still trying to keep you know physical distancing as much as possible um again restrooms are a major uh site where you know obviously people are close uh, but also in terms of the cleanliness just making sure that you have an opportunity to keep them clean after each or or if you're on camps you know every 30 minutes or schedule um you know, after, before and after, you know, lunch when they're probably going to be used the most. Um, again, making sure you're washing your hands after you've used the gloves, just because you've got gloves on uh, doesn't really, uh, you still have to wash your hands after you've utilized those gloves. Um, and again, all hot surfaces, so uh, they could be touched by multiple people. Um, for instance, there was, um, you know, a couple, when I did a practice last week, there was a few parents went and sat at a, a sort of a picnic area off to the side. Again, that's my responsibility. It was our parents that were there. So I had to go over and make sure that we're just cleaning that down because obviously at the next practice, guess what? Somebody's probably going to go and sit there. So um, so just be mindful of, of all of those uh, surfaces and opportunities. There is this sort of mentality that it's gone right and it's far from it and we can get a little bit complacent in terms of those procedures right because you know we, we, we're going back to tournaments we are going back into um you know towards normalcy but that 
doesn't mean that the virus is gone. It doesn't mean that, you know, um, that we should just return back to normal. These procedures are going to probably be in place for a long time, uh, certainly until we get a vaccine. So it's important that you start to evaluate your, ex you know, your clubs and your teams uh, to ensure that they're providing that cleanliness across the board. Uh, we, we will send out the Maryland, or I did, I think I may did it, I've, I sent it this morning. So there's a new Maryland best practices for youth sports. Um, Nathan, I'm not sure if it's possible. Can you try and post that in the chat feature? However, it is in the WhatsApp group. It was posted this morning. Um, again, there's some new guidelines, some new terminology. Uh, previously, it said 15 in a group. Now it's been removed, so there's no limit to your group. Um, however, that is the Maryland State Health Department best practices for youth sport. So that is a, a critical document that you should be evaluating as well as, as club leadership. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Mark. Alan, you sure you don't have anything else to say? <laughs> well, I can keep going if you want. I'll talk all day. <laughs> so any questions for Alan before we go into uh, uh, good and welfare? No questions. Anybody have any topics they want to talk about? Any questions for the State Association? Remember that uh, as soon as uh, we get, we're cleared to socialize again, we're going to have a uh, statewide affiliate social at the new MSYSA office, offices in uh, Howard County. It should be a lot of fun. There's a big, there's a big uh, atrium that we're going to set up. And, you know, uh, I can't wait to get, meet a lot of you guys and, and, and uh, you know, have you come over and see the new office. Mark, can I just jump in there just on, on that note? Um, so in terms of coaching education, um, the, there's, um, we are now working towards establishing those dates for the currently registered participants. So those that are in the D, uh, we also have a C license that's scheduled that's obviously been postponed. Um, so we are close, obviously fields have now opened up. We can start to look at some potential dates and, 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 and that's what we're doing right now. So hopefully, um, uh, there are some modifications that have come from USSF in terms of being able to do possibly the grassroots in courses, uh, in-person courses, the classroom meetings we can possibly do online with a two hour in-person field session, um, as well as the potential to actually get back and utilize classrooms with restricted, uh, classroom sizes. So as club leaders, those that are looking to host grassroots courses um it's getting close i think within another week or 10 days or so we should be able to uh start to open up and discuss you know what that will look like and what we can provide in terms of you know delivering uh the licenses for uh for the state of maryland so hopefully within like i say the next 10 days we will be able to host them for sure at the office um which is another component so um you know, we may be able to deliver the classroom session at the office and then maybe come closer to home for, uh, for the field session, that type of thing. So there's lots of options on the table right now. Uh, we're just trying to, you know, sift through all of it and figure out what's going to be the best course for us. Um, however, we're pretty close to reopening the, the, the license structure. So more will come probably on the next webinar uh, centered around that. Great. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Mike. So uh, any questions? Anybody have any concerns? Any kind of like the jovial chat you want to want to talk about before we end, end the webinar? I hope you guys are enjoying the information. I wish we had more clarity on, on definitive fields and where we can go on. I know it's still, it's still a mess, but the good news is things are opening up. It almost seems like every week we're inching closer and closer to normalcy. You know, if you drive around, you'll see kids on fields again. You'll see, uh, you know, uh, information coming from all different types of jurisdictions telling us 
where what we kind of can't do. So uh, I think that summer is going to be a good test for all of us to see how far we can push the limit about getting back on the field. And I'm hopeful that by fall, we'll be back to some kind of normalcy. So with no, no other questions or concerns, I guess we could end the chat now and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, reconvene in two weeks. I have okay. one question. Excuse me. I have one question. The meeting's over. The meeting's over. <laughs> well, too bad. I need, then I'll call Alan after this. But I've been concerned of what I've seen some people doing. Um, I'm not going to call them out. It's not the time or the place. Uh, but, like, they're private. They're not – I don't know if they're – what their involvement is with the club, but they've been taking photos with kids with private training and getting them all together um, and, uh, you know, throwing that on social media. And I mean, I don't know, because that is going to affect or, or could affect people and, you know, restarting and everything. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I'll keep my mouth shut, but it is kind of alarming. And I don't know if there's anything that, you know, people can do about that. But I've, I've been seeing a good bit of that starting to bubble up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, Dan, because, again, it's it's – you know, I, I use the analogy of the lightning, right? There's a guideline in place. When lightning strikes, you're 30 minutes, you're off the field. There's those that abide by it and those that don't. And it and it's still a constant fight. Um, obviously, we, we cannot, there's no way of governing it. We can't be out at every field. And even, you know, we can't even, even if we know, even if they're posting it and sharing it with everybody and, and we, we know, uh, you know, Ultimately, these are guidelines for you to utilize as best practice. And unfortunately, um, you know, ethically, some, some just don't care. Some will just go back. And, and, and again, I, I get it. There's, there's many challenges, right, in terms of this is the livelihood for some people and they need to return to normalcy as, as quick as they can, right? And, and so we have to respect some of those uh, elements as well, right? We just got to make sure that, you know, the, the child safety is the number one priority, right? And ensuring that those kids are in a safe environment as much as we possibly can, um, you know, and then be mindful of, well, you know, this isn't directly going to affect the kids. It's what happens when the kids go home. And that's something that we tend to forget, right? They may be, they may live with grandparents. They may be in an environment, you know, um, uh, that's that's you know where they're compromised so we have to be mindful of all of these things and and this is why we we say just don't don't be in a rush because um you know if something flares up you need to be able to evaluate that process and what's taken place right over the last couple of weeks so you can mitigate any of those challenges if you've kept your groups in the same group then you know you can identify which group it is right and so you can provide support to those players, to those people. So if you're hosting, you know, um, small group and private clinics, um, small group more so, right? You're bringing in kids from different areas from, you know, um, and over different times, if you're mixing those kids with, you know, try and keep the same groups, right? Is what I'm saying. Because ultimately, if you keep mixing all the players on these small groups, then you know, if anything happens, you're not going to be able to trace who that player has been with and at what time. So uh, it is it is a difficult time in terms of it's now down to the individual's decisions. However, you know, back to when potential issues flare up, it's the, you know, those decisions by that individual is what's going to be questioned. And, and you've got to protect yourself and make sure that you're, you know, uh, guarding yourself from any potential threat of, you know, liability. And, and to do that, you've got to make sure that you have clear policies in place and guidelines that you're adhering to. Otherwise, you, you could put yourself in, in danger. Um, and, and that's ultimately what we've got. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's uh, you got to remember a lot of kids have asthma. I mean, I've got one of our better players, the U19s. You know, he had asthma. He hasn't really set foot out of the house. And some people might say, "Oh, he's overreacting." Not really. Um, yeah. Or Crohn's disease. Um, yeah. And you know, it's really not fair to some of the people. One of them that you work with, who I know, because I just talked to him. Really, I know he's taking pains, taking you know steps. 
to cover, uh, you know, I would feel very good about sending my daughter there, um, right. you know, because he's going to take really big, you know, important steps to make sure that it's all done to the T. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's really not fair to the people that are doing it or clubs that are doing club wide stuff. I mean, I mean, I guess ultimately it's like some people need to check this and see what their players are doing because when they do come back into a team, you know, say in July or August, it, that could be a factor. So Yeah, and we've got to take into consideration, right, those players that are not participating right now, when they do come back, how do we develop training sessions for them? Right, because ultimately we don't want to just throw them in with those kids that have been training for the last three months, you know. So, again, this is why it's a phased approach. Is it a phased approach for everybody in the team as well as the club? No, it, it, it could be we have to look at the individual, we have to look at the team, we have to look at the club aspect, right? And so, these phases are, you know they're in place to ensure that the safeguarding or, or the, not just from COVID, right, but also, you know, ensuring that we reduce the risk of injuries as they return, right, instead of throwing them in and just going, okay, yeah, we're back, you know. Um, I had that situation last night with a 23 group, you know, it's a player that's, um, she had an ACL injury the last 18 months ago, so she's not got back to, you know, competitive. I'm like, go easy, right, understand that, you know, as part of the session, um, you step out when you need to step out and, you you know, disengage when you need to disengage. And we've got to be mindful of all the different areas where there's potential threats. Um, <clears throat> and like I say, not just for COVID, but also for the physical uh, reintroduction of sports, right, and of, of the sport and the nature of the sport. So um, that, that's always got to be mindful too. All right. Any other any other comments before we sign off, Alan? We have one question for you. Someone asked if you wanted to run for political office. <laughs> I don't think they allow Brits in office <laughs> over here, anyway. And any other no, any, any other uh, comments? Anybody want to bring up before we we click the button? Okay. Uh, if you didn't see it, David Louise, you know. Can someone mute him, today. please? <laughs> uh, just a reminder, Liverpool-Everton on Sunday. <laughs> I'll be at the beach. <laughs> Ooh, All right. I just got that. Even better. Just a pity Man City didn't get beat on Wednesday. That would have been even nicer. Dan, I feel better now that you got your third in. Yes, I know. I, it's like, you know, three a day keeps something away. I don't know. This is for Jill out there. She just texted me. Jill? Is she just joining the webinar? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so uh, another good uh, webinar. I hope we helped everybody. Uh, um, I want, I, for the people that are still on, on the uh, call, I want to let you know that uh, our Vice President of Recreation, resigned uh, a few months ago he he actually retired and moved out of the state so the state of maryland is in the process now of looking into finding a new vice president for recreation it's a, it's a position that i can appoint to fulfill the remaining time uh and uh, we'd like to, we really want to find somebody who's extremely passionate about the rec player and rec programs we have money budgeted every year for rec programming for enhancement, and we really want to take advantage of, the, of, of that, of that uh, um, division because rec always seems to sometimes fall to the wayside. And the, this board is passionate also about trying to get information, programming, and passion back in the rec into the rec player. So if anybody has any recommendations that they want to just email me privately, well, what I'd like to do is the, the applicants that are interested in, in coming on the board to be the rec vice president, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, uh, go out and, and, and have like a f informal, you know, cup of coffee and just chat about what they're thinking and, and also let them know about what we're, we as a board, what we're looking for. Any other any other uh, information? 
Julio, did you raise your finger? I was just no, no, no. I was just thinking about the 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 wreck. No, no, I'm good. Oh, okay, I'm good. He had an idea. I would, I would uh -huh. consider you Julio, but with a beard <laughs> like that, you'd scare our rec players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <they're> right. <laughs> This is Valtex there, just to let you know that I've been on their call the whole time. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I'm glad exactly. you reported, sir. I'm glad I you reported in for duty. I don't miss an episode. <laughs> he sat in the hot tub, so he couldn't put the video on. <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, we got, we got 16 minutes until, you know, the stuff starts up again. Thank God, you know. Yeah, we got we have one o'clock. We all got to get off MSNBC. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I got to jump off because I got to get ready to go to the beach. We'll see everybody. Thanks, guys.